Hey guys, this is Mitch with Flying Point CGI, and today we're going to talk about how to do TLS encryption inside of Godot. So we're going to go through the process of basically talking about how TLS works, why you want to use it, what are the benefits, things like that. Then we're going to jump into Godot. We're going to talk about how to generate a self-signed certificate, the advantages and disadvantages of a self-signed certificate, and then we're going to put it into action. So we're going to talk about how to actually encrypt your data, how to actually work with that encrypted data. We're going to talk a little bit about how to use Wireshark to actually sniff your traffic so you can see your data being encrypted. And then finally, we're going to talk about how to create a self-signed certificate using CertBot and what are the benefits and disadvantages of using that. So that's what I have in store for you guys today. Let's go ahead and get started. First, let's talk about some prerequisites. You'll notice that my scene is actually already populated with some stuff you can see right here. Now, the reason why this is, is because I'm actually continuing another tutorial that I previously did, and that is my WebRTC tutorial series. So if you haven't taken a look at that, go ahead and take a look at it, pause this video, go back to that and then do that. Now, that being said, if you already have a WebRTC setup or you already have your networking all set up and done, then you can definitely follow along with this tutorial. It's mostly self-contained, but it's not all self-contained. So that's just something to keep in mind. Now, if you just want to learn the concept, you can just go down to the link in the description below and you can pull down this project and then go ahead and follow along from there as well. So I have lots of options here that you guys can go ahead and do this tutorial. So with that being said, now let's answer the next big question. Why are we doing this, right? What is the purpose of making your stuff secure, right? What is the purpose of encrypting your data in transit? And how does it work? Well, the reason why we're doing this is because if we go ahead and we take a look at some of my code in, I believe it is this one, which is my finished product. If I come in here and I hide under here, and I pull out my TLS setup here, like so, and I come into my server and I pull out my X509 cert, like so. If I hit play and I run this, and then I come into Wireshark, and I'll explain what Wireshark is in a minute. So if I click start server, and then I click start client, you'll notice that I get packets, right? If I click on this, you can see that I can see all different bits of information and things like that with this. You can see HTTP, switching protocol, WebSocket connection, right? If I go and I log in, so this create user actually logs in my user. This is for a future WebRTC tutorial, which we'll be talking about how to create a login system. But if I click on this, you'll see that some more packets come through. Now, if I click right here, this is a WebSocket binary data. And you can see right here, I can actually see the data. ID one, loss is zero, message uh, one, peer ID is this, and our rating is 1000 and our score is 10. So you can see here that you can actually pull back a lot of that information right here. And the part that's problematic is you can pull back user information by doing this, right? So if you were passing in passwords, like for instance, let's say I was passing password data across the network, people could just intercept that data and then actually see it right here and they could steal it and then use it for their own purposes. And also it allows them to intercept that data, change it, and then send it along the pipe. And if I remember to do that, I'll show you guys how that's done and actually talk about it and why it's important. But if we take this data and we encrypt it, and I'll show you how that works. But if we take this data and we encrypt this data, so let me undo what I did. So we'll come in here, change this to our WebSocket connection. We refresh this and we start our server, we start our client, and then we log in. You'll see we get our message right here that says our user has logged in right here. And then if we take a look at our message data, when I scroll all the way to the bottom and I click on that application data, this is what it looks like. So it's completely encrypted and it's impossible to see what that data is. And that's the beauty of encryption. And that is why 
uh, I'm creating this tutorial is to go through how to actually achieve this. So that's the purpose and that's why you want to do it is it makes your game more secure. It makes it so that the data that gets sent across the wire is not sniffed. So if there's any security information, it's not going to get shown. And finally, it stops them from being able to sniff your packets and change the data because that can really mess with the game and can make the game a bit less hacker prone, if that makes sense. All right. So it's really cool to know that it works, but how does it work? Now, if you don't care about how this works and you just want to get to the tutorial, just jump to the next time code and that's totally fine. But how does this actually operate? So basically the way that encryption works inside of Godot is by using TLS encryption. This is also known as SSL. It's basically a tool that is used to secure communication over basically all of the internet. Most of the internet actually uses this system. So how it works, it creates kind of like a safe tunnel between two different uh, groups or two different um, computers. So you have your server and your client, and it basically creates this little secure connection between the two. So the question is, is how does this work? Well, first, the client initiates this handshake. It basically says, hey, I'm a client. I want to talk to you, the server. And then the game server says, okay, cool, right? It'll actually pass a public key to the client, and then the client will have this public key here. Let's take a quick step back. So basically, to get a hold of a key like this, it comes from a certificate authority. Somebody who is a well-known, trusted person creates a key and says, this is a valid key for this game server. The game server has this certificate, which has a public and private key. The client says, hey, I want to talk to this game server. It says, hey, great. Here is a public key from a certificate authority. The client will come to the certificate authority and say, is this a valid certificate? If this Is this a valid key? And the certificate authority will say, yep, I'm okay with this. We're good to go. And then at that point, the, the group decides to basically communicate, right? So what they do is using this public key, they pass a secret across the wire to the game server. And the game server then basically negotiates an encryption algorithm between the two of these guys and it sets up that encryption. And then every single time a message gets sent across the wire, so assume that we have a message with data test, test, right? And then let's say, you know, password, password, right? What it will do is it'll take this, it'll encrypt it with the private key that this guy has. It'll become a mess of gobbledygook. So it just literally becomes just like a mess of, of binary data effectively. It sends it to the client. The client takes that, takes the public key and then decrypts that data and says that this is this data and then it uses the data. So it basically encrypts the data in translation. And that's effectively how this operates. So now that we have a basic understanding of how this operates, how does it work inside of Godot? Well, thankfully, inside of Godot, it's relatively simple. So if we open up Godot here, all we have to do really is add the capability to generate a certificate inside of Godot, then hook up our connection code, and then we should be good to go. So in order to generate a certificate, all we really need to do is go into our host right here, duplicate this button here. We're going to drag this guy down. We're going to call this generate cert. We're going to double click, copy it, go to our inspector, and then control A, control V. We'll drag this guy over here. Node, right click this guy, disconnect our signal, and then right click and connect on button down to our server. I'm going to copy this receiver method and hit connect. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom, I'm going to add in a small little receiver method here. So private void on generate cert button down. And basically we could generate our certificate. You don't want to use self-signed certificates in production. It's considered bad practice, not necessarily because it's unsecure, but it's because you're not validating the server that that information came from. If you remember from our diagram we discussed earlier, you have that cert authority, right? And that cert authority here is basically just handling 
whether or not our stuff is secure. So when we pass our public key to our client here, right? It's gonna check with that cert authority. So if you're using a self-generated certificate, then you're not gonna check that cert authority and you're not gonna be able to validate if that game server is the proper server. So think of it kind of like this. You could have two game servers, have one person that has a non-secure server and have this guy connect up to this game server instead because it got spoofed. Let's say that, you know, there's a router here that these guys are talking between, right? Like so, and a hacker somehow got a hold of this router. When the client connects to the router, it's going to get rerouted from this game server to this game server instead. It's going to pass its public key, I guess this guy, across. And then because the client's not validating that certificate with the cert authority, it doesn't know that it's connecting to the bad game server, not the good game server, if that makes sense. So that's the reason why self-signed certificates are considered not exactly the safest option in the bunch. That being said, there's a lot of games that do it because a lot of people don't really care about security, but it's just not great practice. But in order to generate a certificate, all we need to do is hook up our button, come in here and create a crypto. So we'll type crypto. Crypto is equal to a new crypto like so. We'll say crypto key key is equal to a new crypto key. And then we're going to create our certificate. So X509 certificate cert is equal to a new X509 certificate. Okay. And what this is doing is it's initializing the Godot crypto class and the crypto class is used for things like encryption and things like that. Then we're creating a key because you need to create a key to be able to pass to your users. And then we're creating an X509 certificate. So we're basically creating a certificate that says that this is valid, if that makes sense. And now we just need to generate our key. So we'll say key is equal to crypto dot generate RSA. And then we're gonna choose how, what the length of that RSA certificate is. And typically the larger the length, the better off it's gonna be. My usual is 4096 or 2048. So it's up to you on, on how big your certificate is, but typically 4096 is totally fine. And it's gonna take a lot to decrypt that key. So I wouldn't really worry about it too much. And then we're gonna go ahead and actually generate a self-signed self certificate. So we'll say cert is equal to crypto dot generate self-signed certificate. And you'll notice up here, when we put in these little parentheses here, you're gonna see that it's gonna tell us what we're trying to generate. So you can see we have a crypto key, so we have to pass in a key. Well, thankfully we already generated one, so we'll key. And then they wanna give us an issuer name. And an issuer name needs to be in a very specific format. You need to have quote CN, which is equal to, and that's gonna be some kind of, um, common name. So usually it's like the domain name or something like that. So findpointcgi.com comma O equals, and you need to do an organization. So in my case, findpointcgi, cause that is my business name. And then finally C, which is your country code. So C equals, and there's a two lettered ISO code that you can use. Now, generally speaking, it really doesn't matter when you're doing self-signed certificates, but I'm going to do US because I am in the United States. So we're going to do a semicolon like that. And then we're going to go ahead and save out our key. So key.save, and we'll pass that into our res colon slash slash server key dot key. We'll drop a semicolon and then we'll type cert dot save. And then we're going to save our cert out. So we'll say res colon slash slash, and then server dot cas dot crt and that's going to pass back a cert now once we do that we can hit Control s we can go back to godot here and then we can hit play it's going to compile it's going to attempt to build this and then once it pops up we're going to be able to hit generate cert and you'll notice that nothing has happened but if we head out to our res we open in file manager we bring this guy over here for you you'll notice that it has generated a security certificate 
and a server key right here. So awesome. That means that we have our self-signed certificate built. So now the question is, all right, so we have a certificate, right? How do we actually use it? Well, that's really easy. If we go to our server, we come down here, we find where we're hosting code is located, which is right about here. And we're gonna actually load that certificate. So we'll say var server cert is equal to resource loader dot load. And we'll pass in res colon slash slash server cis dot crt. And because this is C sharp, we need to inform it what type it is. So we'll put bracket bracket and we will call it what it is, which in our case is a certificate. So we'll say X509 certificate. And that's gonna type this as an X509 certificate. And then we're going to need to load our server key. So var server key is equal to resource loader dot load. And it's going to be of type crypto key like that. RES colon slash slash, and we're going to grab our server key like so. There we go. Drop a semicolon. And then we're going to need to modify our create server here. So if we come in here, we hit comma, you'll notice that it says bind address is equal to all right there. So it's a little asterisk there. So quote asterisk comma, and we have to put TLS options. So what I'm going to do is type new TLS options bracket and then we can make a new TLS options. TLS is equal uh, TLS options dot server parentheses. We could pass in our key comma our cert just like that. And that's pretty much all we need to do. If we take a look at our client side, we make sure that our client is hooked up to the proper IP address, which I'm looking to see where is my server URL right here. So this is wrong. So we'll change this to 127.0.0.1 like that. Then if we refresh and we hit play, we hit host, we hit join, you'll notice that we get an error right here. We go to our session two, click on error. You'll see that we have an error. Native calls 51, avoid uh, native calls, TLS handshake error 30976. Now, what this means is that our TLS handshake failed. Remember when I said earlier that the server would negotiate with the client? It would say, hey, here's a, here's a key. We're going to talk about some encryptology, right? And we're, then we're going to actually do our, our connection. Well, you'll notice that we had a little bit of a communication breakdown here, right? And the reason why is because our client here is not using TLS. It's attempting to connect to the game server. If I move this guy down here, let me just disconnect this real quick. It's communicating to the game server and the game server is going, hold on a minute. You are not connecting to me without being a secure connection request. So this guy is saying, hey, I want to talk to you. But the game server is going, no, you are not requesting the correct type of connection. So I'm going to just deny you. And that's really nice because that means people cannot make unauthorized connections to your server with the wrong information, if that makes sense. So what that means in practice for us is that we need to actually add that capability to our client. So if we click on our client code and we scroll down here, there's a section here where we actually connect to our server right here on client join button. Start a client on server URL. Well, much like our actual server, we need to do a proper connection request. So that means that we need to load our certificate, right? That we're going to use to request with our server. And then we need to create our client properly. So we can say var client. CAS is equal to resource loader dot load. And we'll need to type it as a X509 certificate quote res colon slash slash. And I believe if we look at our server, we have it right here. RES server CAS cert. So we'll just copy that guy and paste. And basically we're going to use this certificate 
as a request. We're going to send that certificate out. We're going to request the keys and the information we need to make the connection, and then we'll make our connection. And then much like our server, our client actually has a special way to connect to the server. So the first things first is the server URL. We need to have a WebSocket secure connection. And what that means is instead of a WS, we're going to go with WSS because it's a WebSocket secure connection. And then we're going to scroll back down here and we'll need to add in the information that we expect. So you can see here we're creating our client. Just like our server, we need to add in additional options here. So we'll hit comma TLS options dot. And you'll notice that we have two of them. We have client and client unsafe. So let me pass in client unsafe and I'll explain what the other one is in a second. We'll pass in our client, our client CAS and you'll notice that it's happy. If we duplicate this line and we come in here, get rid of this guy, hit dot client parentheses, you'll notice that there is an X509 certificate required and then there's a common name override. So what's the difference between client and client unsafe. Well, client validates that certificate. Client unsafe does not. So if you remember our diagram here, client unsafe will make the client go to the game server, request the certificate, receive the certificate, and then immediately start communicating with that server. Whereas client, regular client, will request a certificate from the game server, and then it will validate that information with its cert authority. So it'll actually come here, request the info, come back, then go to the cert authority and say, hey, is this a valid certificate or am I getting bamboozled? Am I gonna connect to something that I'm not supposed to? So that's the big difference. Now in our case, because we don't, we are using a self-signed certificate, we're gonna go with client unsafe. Now, if you do have a certificate signed by a signed authority, then go ahead and use client and then you should be good to go. So at this point, we should be good to go over to Godot here and test our connection. So if we go back to Godot, we refresh our connection and we click host and we click join, we should see a peer connected. My ID is this and our ID little return here. So that means that it's working properly, which is awesome. So now the question is, how do we prove that that actually worked? Well, that's where a tool called Wireshark comes in. And I have a link to this in the description below, but Wireshark is an awesome tool. It's used for security and pen testing, and it's also used for development. So if you're doing development and you need to work with packets and things like that, this is really big in the development sphere. So make sure that you check it out and you learn how to use it. And I'll give you a brief overview of how it works. So in order to use it, we need to download it. So let's click on download and then click on the installer or the portable app edition. Now I'm gonna click on the portable app edition because I already have it downloaded. So we'll go ahead and pull that down. So hit save. In my case, I'll click cancel and open up the Wireshark portable PAF file. So we'll double click on that and you'll see it's gonna go ahead and attempt to install it. Now I've already installed it, so I don't need to run through this, but just run through this installation and you'll see that there is a folder right here. So if you double click on that folder and you double click on Wireshark Portable, you can see here is Wireshark. Now you may or may not have this specific screen here. It might require you to install a tool called NCAP. And NCAP allows you to actually sniff packets on your network. So make sure you pull this down. You can see there's an installer right here. Click on this guy right here and run through the installation process. And then it will install the you know requirements for Wireshark. Now, once you have Wireshark up and open, you'll notice that we have an ethernet, a loopback, local area eight, nine, eight, seven, and six, and Bluetooth. Now, this is gonna be different based off of whatever machine you're on. So just keep that in mind. Ethernet is actually my Ethernet adapter. So all the internet that goes in and out, if I'm listening to music or if I'm, you know, playing video games, something like that, all of the packets that go out is through this Ethernet. However, in our case, we're doing loopback testing. And how we know that is because if you look at our project here and we scroll up to the top, you'll see that it says 127.0.0.1. 
that's our loopback address. And the loopback address means that the internet ne that the uh, request packets never leave our actual computer. And they just loop back to our own computer. So that's the reason why it is considered a separate adapter here. Now, so because of that, I'm going to do adapter for loopback traffic capture. In your case, if you're doing something like external testing where you have a server somewhere, then you're going to want to do a different connection like the Ethernet or possibly if you have wireless, you should see something like WLAN zero or something like that. Now I'm going to double click on adapter for loopback and you'll notice that there is a bunch of packets. So how do you know what is Godot and what isn't? Well, that's where this display filter up here comes in handy. So what we can do is we could type tcp.port is equal to 8916, I believe is what we're using. It's right here, 8916, and UDP port 8916, like that. And you'll notice that our packets all of a sudden get cleared out. And the reason why is because there's nothing getting fired on that specific information. So this allows you to filter out your data based off of your port. And typically when I'm using Wireshark, I know exactly which port I'm going to do this on. So I just immediately filter it out like this and it solves that problem. And now all I have to do is go back into Godot here, refresh my project, hit host, hit join, and you'll see we have peer connected ID, my ID. If we look at Wireshark, what does that look like for Wireshark? Well, right now it looks like nothing. So my guess is, did I get the wrong IP address or the wrong search? Because that should have worked. And it's because I'm using and, I should probably use or. There we go. So I used and, so only packets that are on, uh, that are TCP and UDP were going to show up. I wanted packets that were on TCP or on UDP. So that's my fault. Now you'll notice that we have a bunch of packets. So that's great. You'll see that we have a red packet here, which basically is a brand new connection. You'll see that we have a, looks like a transmission packet to create our connection. We get an acknowledgement, we get a hello. So this is us starting our negotiation. So the client goes to the server and says, hello server. The server says, hello client. Uh, the client sends it the certificate and says, hey, here's my certificate. The server passes back a key. Server says, hey, yo, I'm good. Client does a small key exchange. They actually de decide on a cipher. They're doing a handshake. They actually change their cipher spec. So they did not agree on the cipher 100%. And then they created an a actual handshake. So all of this is what happens for us to create that connection. And then from here, we have our application data. So this is some application data. This is some application data. This is some application data, right? But you'll notice that right here, this is this message right here. But you really can't see it, right? That's because it's encrypted. It's 100% binary data and nobody can see it other than the client and the server themselves. So our packet sniffer itself cannot actually see the data that's being exchanged. And even cooler than that, if we shut it off, I'll show you guys real quick. If we shut off WebSocket Secure, so WS, Control S, scroll down here. Let's find this guy here. Let me comment that guy out, start that WebSocket connection, and then go to our server and do the same thing. So on our server, let's just kind of close that guy off, bracket, comment that guy out like so. And then if we go back here and refresh, we hit host, we hit join, we'll get the same data because we just pulled off our secure WebSocket connection. If we take a look at Wireshark, you'll see here where that red line is. You'll notice A, there's less packets, but B, you'll notice that there is no client hello certificate, server exchange or anything. It just immediately jumps into passing our data. But if we click on our WebSocket binary right here, you can see there's our data in plain text. We can actually see what was passed from one person to another. And that is the big benefit to having TLS encryption is that it's going to encrypt that data so that people can't sniff that data. So if you're passing stuff like passwords and security data back and forth, you're not gonna cause, you're not gonna allow people to read that data, if that makes sense. So that's pretty much how you do encryption for all of your data in movement. 
So now your other big question might be, okay, so that's cool, but how do I actually get a proper certificate that's not self-signed? Well, that's a little bit more complicated. So there are a few sites that offer them. One of the biggest places that offer it is called Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt is really big in the industry for free certificates. But unfortunately, if you have Let's Encrypt, then you need to have a proper domain name that this thing can how can live on, if that makes sense. So you can't just say, oh, hey, I want a certificate and it gives you one. You have to get a certificate. You have to get a domain name for Let's Encrypt to actually be registered with. Now, in my case, I actually have a domain name specifically for this. And in my case, I got my domain name through Namecheap. Now, Namecheap does not sponsor me or anything like that, but this is actually where I got my domain name, which in my case is findpointcgi.xyz. And thankfully, the XYZ monikers are really cheap. So if you're looking for a domain name that you want for your game that's really cheap, XYZ has always been pretty cheap. Um, I think I picked this up for like $2, I want to say. But if we go back to our domain, you need to host something on a server and set up a DNS record for them. So you can see I have an A record here and it goes to an IP address right here, which is my YouTube Digital Ocean account here. So the nice thing about this is it basically has my IP right here. So I basically linked this with my Namecheap and that is how I basically did this section. Now, once you have this set up, to be able to generate a certificate, if you connect to your digital ocean, you can use a thing called CertBot. And CertBot, if I bring that up real quick, CertBot is really cool because it basically handles getting a certificate for you automatically. So you need to have a domain name and you need to have some kind of server to put that uh, DNS record and point that record to a server. And you need to have CertBot on that server to get you that record, if that makes sense. So what you can do to generate a record is if I open up my YouTube Digital Ocean here, if you come up here, you can type sudo snap install dash dash classic certbot. And what that's going to do is it's going to actually install certbot onto your server. And then once you have certbot installed, all you need to do is you need to sudo ln dash s slash snap slash bin slash certbot space slash user slash bin slash certbot. And that will actually create a symbolic link. I've already done that, so it's going to fail in my case. And then you need to actually run your certificate server. Now, if you have a web server, you need to go through their instructions to do it. But if you don't, I can show you guys how to do that. So you just type sudo cert bot cert only dash dash stand alone like that. And what this is going to do so it's going to tell CertBot to basically create a certificate. And then you input the domain name that you got. So in my case, it's findpointcgi.xyz. And what it's going to do is it's going to come in and, well, in this case, it's actually going to let me keep my certificate because I, I can't renew my certificate. I already have one. But what it's going to do is it's going to go and register with Let's Encrypt our web server as a valid server, if that makes sense. So I'm going to hit one, hit OK. So that way I'm not going to renew my cert, my actual certificate. Now, once you have your certificate, you need to download it to put it into your Godot project. So if you come into FileZilla and you connect up to your droplet, which in my case, I have it hooked up right here. But if you haven't ever done a FileZilla, basically you just set up FTP support in your digital ocean droplet, which is pretty simple. You just download an SSL cert and you hook it up with your droplet. And if you guys want a more thorough you know, tutorial on that, let me know and I can kind of walk you guys through it. And then you guys head out to slash ETC. And then you'll want to go into Let's Encrypt live. Find point CGI XYZ, and you'll see that they have cert perm, chain, full cert, and privkey.perm. Now, 
you'll see that I've already navigated to our WebRTC tutorial here. And what we'll want to pull down is priv key and full chain. And what that is, is it's the actual private key and the full chain of custody of that data. So we'll pull these guys into our Godot project. We'll download them like so. And you'll see when I come into our WebRTC project here and I refresh, you'll see priv key and full chain right here. So priv key, full chain. You notice that they're perm files. Now, one of the cool things about certificates, if I open up VS Code here and I grab full chain.prim, so this file right here, and I click on it, you'll see it'll say begin certificate end certificate, begin certificate, end certificate, right? And if I grab my server CAS CRT, you'll notice that they're the same thing. And the reason why is CRT is Windows, Prim or PEM -E is Linux. So because we did our stuff on Linux, it's just a PEM file, but the content itself is pretty much the same. You'll notice that they look the same. And that's because they're both X509 certificates. So they're the exact same thing. They're just named slightly different. So if we just come in, right click, rename this to a CRT file, because Godot will not recognize it if it's not a CRT file. And if we do the same thing, if we look at key and we look at our priv key.prim, you'll see that they're pretty much the same thing. Begin private key, begin private key. This says RSA just because it's denoting that it's an RSA but generally speaking, it's fine. So if we just rename this as priv key dot key like that, that's gonna make it so that Godot can read it. And then from here, all we have to do is just repoint our certificates. And if we close these guys, we go into our, let's close this, go into our server and change this from server cas.crt to full chain.crt. And we change this from server key to priv key dot key like that. And then we go to our client and we change server CAS dot cert to, I believe it was full chain CRT. And then we can comment out our valid, our uh, unsecure, unsafe version of our client. And we can hook up our actual client version. So I can pass in client CAS comma common name override find point CGI dot X, Y, Z. And this here is your domain name, right? So it's the name that you use to register that certificate. You can hit control S and then you can come in here, click on Godot, hit play, host, and then join. And you will notice that we get our connection as expected. And that's because our certificate is now valid. So it's actually a valid certificate that we can use in the future. Now, there's a lot more to uh, automatically updating your certificate and stuff like that. But generally speaking, this is how you do it. Now, what I would do if I was in your guys' shoes is I would use CertBot to manage my certificate here. And I would make it so that I have a symbolic link to that perm file and then basically uh, rename that perm file anytime it gets updated if that makes sense, and then have it automatically update. Um, these certificates are only valid for, I believe it's 90 days, and then you'll need to renew it. So it's one of those things that you have to do every 90 days or else your game's not going to work. So that's why I would put this on a schedule and then I would actually automatically update my stuff here on my digital ocean. So I would export this project out and put it in here and then automatically, you know, move the file over with like a bat file or something like that every 90 days or something like that to get it. So it's up to date, if that makes sense. But that's basically how you get a valid certificate for your game. But at this point, I think you guys pretty much have everything that you guys need to kind of get started with certificates in Godot. So if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. Hey, you know, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit that dislike button because I'm here to make content for you guys. This video was a viewer suggested video. So if you have any suggestions, please drop them in the comments below or jump on my GitHub link is in the description and leave a suggestion in my suggestion slot because that's where I keep track of a lot of the tutorials that I do and things like that. So it's really good for me to have a list of tutorials to work from. And hey, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments below or jump on my Discord link is in the description for that. And anyone there will help you out with any issues you might be having. But that is all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much again for watching. And I will see you all next time. Thanks.